Welcome back, everyone. Only after two hours inside the program, we're already digging in and we're already starting the discussions on the topic of the conference. After the presentations of the researchers who already gave us a small insight on, on what, they, what have they found out from all the data that they gathered throughout the last months, we are going to go on to our first panel discussion. The idea of the conference is to create a dialogue and to offer space for young people to discuss directly with policymakers and other stakeholders in the process of youth participation. And this is going to be the spirit of the debate that we are going to organize now. Before I introduce you to the debate, I would like to explain on how it is going to be working. We are going to have one round where we will have our guests, that they will present themselves briefly, but they will already start answering certain questions we prepared for them. In the meantime, while they're actually answering the questions, you're encouraged that in the chat, you already start writing some questions that you would like to address. My co-facilitator is going to be following the chat and they will communicate with me the questions that we will bring in to the stage. They will ask you if you would like to also join us live, because the idea is, as we said, that throughout this conference, we create dialogues. So we will have one opening round, and then the floor will be yours. Follow the, follow the discussions, follow the, the inputs from our panelists, and then ask questions that afterwards we will we'll have the chance to follow up. If there are some questions that stay unanswered, we will then talk with our panelists afterwards, so we can get some of the answers afterwards, and we can share them through the social media that we use, through the sharing tools that we use, such as Padlet and Menti. So just a bit uh, briefly before we start on what is the objective of today's debate. Today we want to discuss a bit the future. We have been talking a lot about COVID. We have been talking on, on how this became a barrier for participation for young people in different processes. In the discussion that we want to organize now, we want to be a bit forward-looking. So we will talk on what are the challenges, but more we are going to focus on what have we learned from them and what can be the next step forward. For this, we have a nice variety of guests that we have invited. So I will not take more time, but I'm going to actually introduce the guests that we have today. Today we, with us, we have a variety of directly representative uh, groups of young people, but then also other stakeholders that are directly involved in working with the young people directly. Today with us, we have uh, Mr. Mihai Dragos, who is the Vice Chair of the Advisory Council on Youth of the Council of Europe. We have Ms. Um, Elsie, who is here in the, from the National Youth Council of Sweden, and then she, she has participated already in the three conferences uh, of the Youth Dialogue, and she's going to give us a bit the Youth Delegate perspective. Bes besides this, we have Christiana here in from the European Youth Forum, who is a board member who is responsible to, um, to uh, follow the Youth Dialogue and the implementation of the, of the Look Dialogue itself. We have uh, Mr. Uros Skriner with us, who is the head of the uh, agency for, that is implementing Erasmus Plus, the youth program and European Solidar Solidarity Corps in Slovenia. And we have Ms. Jasna Maric Krajci, who is here in the name of the European Commission direct from the Director General for Education and Culture. These are going to be our speakers, speakers, so follow them closely in their opening statements, and then afterwards, immediately, you're going to get some space to ask some questions. I would like to start with Mihai. Mihai, I have a question for you regarding the position that you're in. You're representing the Advisory Council on Youth. It is the highest decision-making body for young people in the Council of Europe, and it's the body that actually had to work online throughout its whole mandate. You work in a very specific structure where you're meeting, the policymakers are also meeting on another side in the co-management structure. So I guess that there has been a lot of know-how and a lot of things that you have learned through this process and in this year. So I would like to ask you in the next four minutes to tell us a bit on how was it to be in the Advisory Council during this period and what are the main things that you have learned and you would like to take forward after the pandemic has, been, has ended. So Mihai, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this question. Indeed, uh, we have had a challenging mandate. Uh, we were very lucky to meet in person in January last year. Um, otherwise, I don't know how this could have worked. Um, and uh, we had to have all our meetings online. What we have learned during this time is that on the one hand, of course, you can still participate even if you have to do it online, uh, but uh, it cannot really replace the offline experience. This is because, for example, um, in some of our main uh, processes, one of them being the development of a recommendation on protecting youth civic space, 
um, uh, we really felt we needed to discuss more with representatives of government in person to uh, address all the differences that we had and to find the best ways to move forward. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to adopt the proposal of a recommendation at our joint council meeting in October. Uh, but the process has probably taken longer in these conditions. Um, and uh, also our representation activities where we were um, asked to attend events and to promote the policies of the Council of Europe and to promote our work, uh, they're not really the same online. Of course, you can attend many more events, but uh, it's not the same. And even at the level of the Advisory Council, there have been participation issues uh, with people, uh, you know, because uh, participating in events offline, you still need to take time off uh, work. You still need to, um, you know, participate and often you have to take a full day for preparations and um, it, it's it's really been complicated. However, the work of the, of, of the statutory bodies has moved on uh, and we have managed to be a part, probably we managed in some ways to be more present in Council of Europe activities, for example, especially in the parliamentary assembly activities where we managed to attend several sessions. It might have been more difficult if uh, we had to go physically every time we attended one of the sessions. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in, in some ways, this might have actually facilitated a more in-depth cooperation with um, at the Parliamentary Assembly as well. But we are all very, very, very eager to restart physical activities. And I think I cannot stress this enough. We need to find ways to work uh, digitally, online, but we must keep physical participation up and running um, because otherwise we will not be able to have the same experience. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much, Mihai. And thank you very much for the specific points that you already gave in, in the beginning. We are going to move on now to, to Elsie. Elsie has followed, if I'm correct, the three conferences of the Youth Dialogue in this cycle. And she is the Youth Delegate from Sweden. So she has had the experience to also uh, participate in the online activities that were organized as part of the Youth Conferences, but also organizing activities in between uh, the conferences. So Elsie, we have a question for you. So what is your view? How would and should the participation look like post-pandemics? Well, I think during this pandemic, it's it's been a bit of a double-sided uh, um, situation for youth and youth participation. In the long term, um, I believe that our participation will be better from the challenges that we have experienced. Um, we, the whole world, was thrust into a digital space since we couldn't leave our homes. And digi the digital spaces is where youth have an advantage of the older generations. Um, so we have, since more things are moving online, there are more um, possibilities to participate online. Um, and also, if you look at youth with disabilities, um, in a whole nother way than before, youth with disabilities have been able to participate. It's a shame that that society wasn't prepared to create these digital tools before the pandemic so everyone could be included. Um, but inclusion has um, been amplified um, through the digitalization that has happened during the pandemic. However, the pandemic also has come um, has put enormous strains on our economy, um, enormous strains politically, enormous strains um, on society as a whole, really, um, which means that the enormous stimulus packages, the enormous um, COVID relief bills, and so that we have seen both on the national level, but also a next generation EU, which is you hear in the name, it's a very forward thinking thing. They are huge packages um, of, of and, and funds that is going to put the EU in debt for a long time to come, which means that my generation, our generation, is going to be the one ultimately to pay for all of this. Yet um, there hasn't been that good consultation um, in that. So going forward, looking at, at how youth are involved, we've, we've been given a responsibility um, economically to, to pay for these COVID relief bills. Um, also with climate change, um, also been given a pretty hostile climate to live in from previous generations. So um, it's not, youth has no other choice than to step up and do something about it. Um, it's, 
I do see that we have then now the, the conference on the future of Europe, which I see as a fantastic ability for, for youth to participate. And I have been partaking in, in um, activities there. And I would even say that we can learn a lot from that and implement into the European Youth Dialogue. I would say that the my personal opinion is that the um, the conference on the future of Europe is is it's much better and um, high quality participation than the European Youth Dialogue. And I think we really need to have a, a meta perspective in, in this cycle and see how we can make this dialogue better um, so we can enable youth to, to participate um, going forward. Um, so, yes, short term um, youth participation hasn't been great during the pandemic. Um, long term, we we are moving politics into spaces that is that are youth dominated, but we're also given responsibilities that we didn't that we weren't really part of the consultation when when um, they were assigned to us. Um, and and going forward, we really need to look over this conference, given the other um, member participatory events that the EU is doing that are honestly of, of more high quality than than this dialogue. Thank you very much, Elsie. Thank you so much for, for the information and the comparisons. Uh, before we move on to the next speaker, I would like to thank the people who already asked some questions in the chat. Please do so. For the other ones, please uh, ask your questions throughout the, the speeches from our guests, because right afterwards you'll have the space to join in the discussion yourself. So, Christiana, we've actually met on the Youth Dialogue. Um, uh, you have been previously a youth delegate, but now you're here representing the European Youth Forum. It's the biggest youth representation platform, and it's working a lot on different campaigns to mobilize young people to be involved in the policy developments about young people in Europe. At the moment, just uh, Elsie already started comparing it with the Conference on the Future of Europe, so at the moment you're already implementing a pro project for the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is called 25%. So you have already tried to involve young people people in the process uh, and in the pandemics to be actively uh, participating in different activities. Was this easy and how is it with the experience of young people participating online? It's our space where we are the most active ones, but when it comes to participation, what is your um, judgment on the current situation? First of all, thanks to see you again, Milos. Indeed, you were among the first people that I've met during the process of youth dialogue um, six years ago. Um, so 25%, uh, at first, let me give you a brief introduction to the project. Um, so despite making up a quarter of the European population, young people face many barriers to having a say, uh, especially on our future. Whether it's a lack of opportunities and representation or knowledge for effective advocacy, and most of the times, we are left without ways to share our voice and to make changes, to the changes that we want to see in our world. That's the 25% is a project for young people, created by young people, to make sure that our ideas are listened to, where decisions are made, and to give the tools and resources uh, to young people uh, that they need to challenge the status quo and take actions on the issues they care about. In 2021, uh, as uh, Elsie said, the European Union is calling all citizens to participate in the Conference on the Future of Europe and form together our vision for our continent. This gave us actually the inspiration to start this project, uh, to make sure that youth voices are heard there and that young people have the power to change Europe. What exactly uh, we want to achieve with this? Well, young people to participate in the Conference on the Future of Europe and share their ideas, young people to learn how to make a change in their communities and take action on the issues they care about, and young people to be heard by policy and decision makers. More concretely, to achieve our vision, we want to connect, we want to educate, and we want to empower young people. Um, and that's why we have some activities uh, 200 local and five national events, reaching at least 3,500 participants. Uh, well, during these events, young people will learn how to raise their unique voice at the conference and beyond. And there are also some other concrete um, things that we're, are already in the process of making. So I'm taking the opportunity now and I'm encouraging you to go and visit our website on the 25%, which is 3w25%.eu and submit your own unique idea. So going back to your main question, Milos, I can say that young people reject politics as usual. 
we are participating less and less in traditional forms of democracy, such as elections, but we choose new political movements over more established political parties, and we participate in a number of new and different ways, including using opportunities provided, of course, by digitalization. We as young people are the biggest users of technologies. In terms of, action, of access to the internet, just one percentage of young people have never accessed the internet, while 95% use it daily, and 89% prefer to use mobile devices uh, as access points. We use social media, for example, for political purposes, to read the news and to network with uh, our peers and to build communities mobilized around the common use. Also, interestingly, uh, the previous youth dialogue cycle discovered that young people from minority backgrounds found social media and general internet searches more important for accessing, in their own view, thoughtful information than young people from non-minority backgrounds and more opportunities for participation. During this pandemic, online participation, of course, contributed to ensuring that young people are connected and able to participate in society. However, while safety measures were essential to protect the population, we have witnessed alarming measures affecting our civic space and young people's participation. Among other things that we noticed, uh, the spaces for, particip for participation for young people in decision-making processes, even online, were limited. Access not ensured and not taking, uh, taking into account the specific needs of young people and youth organizations for them to be able uh, to meaningfully engage. Even for those who use the internet regularly, uh, reliance on the internet in the spring of 2020 uh, due to the COVID pandemic has also raised questions and exposed inequalities related to um, the availability of data to access online content uh, and also the availability of computers within households. Uh, hence, indeed, online spaces for participation were useful to assure uh, some degree of youth engagement and young people themselves proactively using online tools uh, also positively contributed to addressing some challenges that we have been facing in this pandemic. But it would be false to say that it was the remedy uh, that solved everything. Physical spaces and opportunities for participation remains uh, as important as ever. Uh, and digital tools offer new opportunities for participation for uh, youth through the use of various uh, tools, uh, such as decision-making tools, online petitions, online voting, social media, in governments, and etc. However, the future of youth participation should be reinforced, uh, but not replaced by digital means. This is what we are trying also to do with a 25% uh, project to reinforce the voices of young people in addition to tools and mechanisms that are there uh, to actually uh, for young people to participate offline, uh, normally, of course, outside the pandemic, like, uh, for example, the EU Youth Dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christiana, for, for the presentation and then giving us these this views and the experiences of the Youth Forum. Now we're going to go back to the studio a bit. Uh, so here with me I have Urosh. Um, as I presented, Urosh is the head of the um, national agency which is implementing Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps. The mobility is very important as a stimulator for young people to participate more, but also to feel European uh, and then being engaged in European processes. So. What were the main challenges that you faced as an agency when it comes to giving these opportunities to young people in the COVID times? What were the, the main things that stopped young people participating? We all know, the, but how was this inter interpreted in the program uh, as such? Yes. Firstly, uh, it's nice to be here. Um, and I will start like it's not only youth mobility, it's youth learning mobility that has very concrete aim to basically support personal and professional developments of young people, participants in the projects that we are supporting through Erasmus Plus Youth Program and Solidarity Core Program. With the very concrete goal that they get their competencies, that they learn basically how to participate, that they are able to communicate with their colleagues in other languages and similar. And yes, uh, Erasmus+, Plus, as you all know, has for this period an 
extensive increase in budget, so that means a lot of opportunities to support concrete projects. In new thing in Erasmus is also youth participation activities that are going directly to the needs of young people on local, national, and also transnational levels to support groups of young people to be able to participate, to learn from each other, and basically to foster their active European citizenship, like you said. Why is this important? Because, as my colleagues said already, young people are not only the future of European Union, they are also the present of the European Union. So, to support their active participation, to support them to be fully capable to impact local communities is crucial. What is also important is that we can say that through the pandemic, of course, programs that are supporting mobilities were stopped, yeah, because of all the restrictions and so on. But they were stopped for not so long time, if I may, may say it like that. Some projects, yes, others were basically going after first round of crisis management, if I say it like that, on. Solidarity projects were basically huge participation of young people in building solidarity in Europe was seen and is still seen. And we have fantastic stories that we need to be proud of. And that is exactly what also the colleagues were saying. Young people were very quickly responding to different situations that they were there. So, of course, pandemic is still on. Uh, limitations to travel are still on. Uh, I think we are getting slowly to, to phases that more and more mobility is on its way, and with that also possibilities for young people. But as I always say, programs are only giving possibility and opportunities. Young people and youth organizations that are supporting young people need to take these opportunities that are existing. Thank you, thank you very much, Uros. We're also going to go now back to uh, our uh, guests who are online, and we are going to speak with Jasna from uh, representing the European Commission. Um, the European Commission has been investing quite a lot in the development of youth work, youth participation mechanism on, on European level, and at the moment is, is uh, going forward and seeing on what can be the role of young people in the recovery process of the EU. We were seeing on uh, LCR dimension is that young people should be there in the recovery process and they should have their role. So, Jasna, nice to see you again. Uh, and um, uh, we would like to ask you, what do you think, what should be the role of the young people in the recovery process of the European Union? Uh, hello to everybody. It's a great privilege and pleasure to represent the Commission uh, at this panel. It's a pity, of course, that I'm not in Maribor and all of us, because I know, for example, Maribor very well, having lived in Slovenia for a while. Just at the beginning, maybe just a very quick historical wrap-up of EU cooperation the youth field that started in 2002 providing at first a uh, policy framework for EU youth programs implemented since 1988. So we have quite a history here. Uh, the current youth strategy, which will be in place until 2027, is a third generation framework. And we, what we try to do is here really to have a dual approach. It's very important to say that we um, also with, we all know now that we have a new youth coordinator since June. And what we try to do is to mainstream youth relevant initiatives across a wide area of policy. Uh, initi initiatives, and also secondly, to address the disengage, connect, and empower core areas in the youth sector. Of course, engage stays, st uh, stays for in strengthening young people's democratic participation with having the youth dialogue at the center. I must say I take very seriously also the critique from Elsie and from others about the youth dialogue not always uh, being up to uh, to uh, the challenges that uh, that we face. Secondly, the youth in the youth sector we have uh, connect. These are our mobility opportunities, um, and the colleague uh, Uros has really talked about them uh, quite in an affirmative way. Even we managed to do quite a lot in the in these uh, in the pandemic. And the third one is empower. Uh, about which I will talk a bit later, uh, to support youth work activities. When we in the Commission talk about youth spaces, which is a very relevant um, thing, is, and, and, and it's fantastic that it was the theme of this uh, current cycle, is that we have a commitment to provide youth spaces for young people, but also with them. And uh, these youth participation activities that uh, the colleague Udis from the youth, uh, from the Erasmus Agency talked about is really uh, one of a very good example that we, we have, of course, in Erasmus, 
young people participate with uh, when talking to decision makers, but it's really important that they have their own small scale uh, projects um, and that they, they, they are successful in it to build them themselves, because in this way they can set up their own ideas, realizing new ideas. I think I can say also here that we were all very excited and a bit surprised also that we had this year that uh, the president in the uh, uh, pronounced this year um, the European Year of Youth. And uh, for us in the Commission and among our colleagues, it is a year that um, is actually, we see it as a year dedicated to, to empowering young people because young people have given quite a lot uh, in this pandemic and also before. And uh, uh, for us, it's um, also, it was very poignant when, when the president said that Europe needs all of its youth. So um, in this way that um, for us in the, in, in the commission is that um, it is everything what the EU does from the European Green Deal to the next generation uh, EU initiative, that it has, it is important that it has a very strong link uh, to, uh, to protecting young people's future and uh, uh, with a strong focus on sustainability and inclusion because these are the two things that young people uh, really uh, uh, care about uh, the most. Um, so um, concretely to, to uh, let's say, to mitigate the adverse effects of the pandemic, uh, funding for, um, for uh, 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 from the next generation next uh, generation EU initiative will provide strong support in many policy areas uh, linked, for example, to uh, like the education, skills, employment, green and digital uh, transition. And um, of course, the, 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 the Commission has a special uh, has a special role in this. So, um, and uh, when you talk about the recovery, we are keenly aware that young we need young people's energy and, and, and uh, all the knowledge that you have. So for us, what is most important is actually, and we have the means, right, the, the framework, that we uh, create a strong basis for, um, for that all young people have access to opportunities and the necessary support to live, to work and to, um, to thrive in, this, uh, uh, in, in, in the EU. And for that, the, the, we, are, uh, um, uh, we actually need what we, through the EU strategy, uh, this is vast vital is that that if young people want to achieve these goals we need to our duty is to really um continue in setting up a strong policy framework what we what we are trying to do to enable exchange of knowledge and and mutual learning between member states and also to um to channel funding from Erasmus Plus and other EU programs towards the, the to these three strategic pillars to engage connect and and and, and empower so for us as we said, we are working closely with all the youth stakeholders, especially with the European Youth Forum, uh, to enable this framework to make funding available for this. Thank you very much for, for this input. And um, thank you very much for all of our guests that share with us their opening statements. And as I said, now we're going to move on to the space where we want to create a dialogue here. We want the, our participants, and we have more than 100 participants on this conference, and then many more following us live. Um, through the stream. So I would ask firstly to have maybe a couple of people that will join us in live that will share their questions. And then we are going to see for the next round if we can just read a couple of questions from the chat. Thank you very much for my co-facilitators and thanks for everyone for uh, asking the questions. In the beginning, I would like to give the floor to Maria from Bulgaria that is going to join us live and will ask the question uh, to our guests. So Maria, um, do you hear us? I guess it takes a couple of seconds before Maria is uh, added to the uh, uh, stream. Okay, we don't hear the feed yet. So I guess we can move on with the next person, since I cannot see the feed coming from the person that would like to join us live. Um, so I will ask Mari if you can unmute yourself uh, because, and then you'll be able to join us. Yes, hi. Perfect, thank you very much. 
Uh, so my question is for um, Elsie. Um, what advice would you give to the people who are who are <laughs> delegates uh, for the first time? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. So this goes to us. I'm going to ask us to go on to the next person that we would like to join in live. As I said, we are going to get a couple of people that will join us live uh, before we uh, move on. So um, I would like to ask Damiana, uh, Damiana Zaharieva from Bulgaria also to join us live and share the question with our guests. So Damiana, you would have to unmute yourself if this would be the challenge again. Her question was for Elsie. So Elsie, you can get ready with the answer. Okay. Can you Hi, hear me now? Yes, perfect. Hello. So my question is for everyone. Is Do you think the incline of access for some people, like people with disabilities, was on account of others, like people with fewer opportunities from different economic backgrounds, who has no access to digital tools and how we can fix that. Thank you very much, Damiana. This is also the question that all our guests can get ready for a round of a quick, quick answers. And then I'll also take Jakub Vashak from the Czech Republic, from Czechia, if you can join us live and ask the question. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, perfect. Uh, first, I would like to thank all the guests for their contribution. It was quite interesting for me. And uh, as they as they spoke, I was thinking about one one of the things that worries me actually, which is uh, that I've been hearing a lot of let's say strong words about how to change uh, how we perceive uh, young people and what changes we can do. And it, that I heard even uh, in the last EU YEC as well. And I, I've seen it in the reports uh, from the last ones as well. So it's not like we don't have any success, but it, it's a bit frustrating for me that even with COVID, which showed us like, this is the thing we have to improve. This is the thing we have to improve. I have a feeling that uh, it's uh, taking such a long time and that even uh, with these pinpoints, which COVID gave us, we're again losing the sense of uh, how to actually do it. Or that's what it seems to me because like we have elections now in the Czech Republic and like COVID is for sure, isn't for sure one of the biggest um, topics. So my question would be, what is your opinion uh, on this? Or what would you see as one of the tools that maybe COVID showed us uh, throughout the pandemic? Uh, and how could we actually move, move forward uh, in, in this aspect? So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jakob. I'm going to start with the first quick question from Maria to uh, Elsie. Elsie, if you can, in a very uh, short uh, time, tell us on how to be a good first time you delegate. What are your tips and tricks? Um, I find it uh, quite funny because I have no real merit to be sitting in this panel of other from any other youth delegate at this conference. Um, I think the thing that to me makes a good delegate and what to me um, what I appreciate in my colleagues is is an honestness and a frankness um, we come to this dialogue to talk about the challenges that youth are facing um, and even though it may be hard to swallow sometimes and it is um, I think we should be very um, I think we should dare to speak our minds and to be quite honest with the challenges we face and not sugarcoat them, um, to f freely express what, what is worrying us um, and not be afraid that it's not diplomatic or it's, it's not sensitive or um, it doesn't sound nice, quote unquote. Um, I, my best advice would just be, be honest, be, have a frank conversation because um, that's what we're here for. 
Thank you very much, Elsie. I think it's very well said. Use the space which is given there and uh, use it with sharing your opinion. Um, then I will go to the next question, which was from Damian, which was very much on the inclusion aspect when it comes to participation, especially she, uh, she mentioned people with disabilities. Um, what have we learned and how can we do it better? Maybe I can start this time here with Urosh, because maybe it's something you faced a lot when it comes to the implementation of the projects and everything, and then we can go on with, with a round. So let's just have some quick answers so we also have a space for a couple of more questions afterwards. Yes, okay. Um, I will start that social inclusion and diversity is, was, and it will be also in the future, one of the core horizontal priorities for the EU programs. I think this is fantastic, and I think that we need to work on this even more. This means that also, and I'm talking, sorry, only for implementation of Erasmus yeah. Plus yeah. Youth Program and Solidarity Core Program, uh, that means that also in supported projects, there are special aims, uh, sorry, means that can basically support participation of all young people, regardless any circumstances that they have, especially focusing on participation of young people with disabilities or young people with fewer opportunities. I must say that national agencies are extremely working on this, and I think that we will be working also in the future uh, to actually give tools and mechanisms, as, I, as, as is what said, it was said before by Philip, I think, a few uh, hours uh, before this panel, that they need tools and mechanisms. And uh, concretely, uh, in time of pandemic, European Commission made different approaches or different possibilities for supported projects so that the national agencies could allow also supported projects to buy equipment to basically, or not only buy, but rent equipment that was needed for the participation of young people in the projects that were already approved. But in general, I think we were all stuck at the beginning of the pandemic with all, all with a lot of challenges faced. You know that there was also not enough IT technology around us and so on. So I am also quite uh, optimistic that we learned a lot out of pandemic, as my uh, colleagues already said, that we also find new ways of participation and that now we need to find how to go on, not forgetting that still we need social contact, that we need to meet and that we are all missing this a lot. Yeah, uh, Pandemic only opened a lot of problems that they were there already. Yeah not only forgetting on mental health issues of young people. I need to address this. Yeah? Uh, the mental health issues of young people were here before the pandemic. We saw them, we were just not working on the resolving them enough. And now we will need to, because it's probably already a little bit too late. Thank you very much, Urosh. I will also pass the floor to Jasna, since we are on the institutional side. The commission was mentioned. So, Jasna, would you like to add something from, uh, from what was shared from Urosh when it comes to inclusion and creation of yes. spacings for inclusion? Yes, indeed. Uh, my colleague Urosh has said already quite a lot. But, for example, we are working closely with our seven resource Salto centers. And one of them is our, uh, our in inclusion and diversity Salto, which has published a... Uh, very good publication on uh, inclusion and has actually uh, an inclusion and diversity strategy with quite a co few concrete tools and ways how to to um, to include in which way the tools also in the ways how to include people with fewer uh, with a diverse background and and disadvantaged young people so we know it's very often an uphill struggle and we all know that uh, it's difficult to to reach out and and to actually get to young people with a with a diverse uh, background, and uh, we're doing this uh, constantly, helped by youth organizations, helped by our research centers, helped by other institutions who have the same problem. So um, it is an uphill struggle, and we're working on it. Uh, and definitely, it's something that it, it's in the youth strategy, which, as I said, is lasting until 2027. I think a great help is also that we continuously work with research uh, with researchers who have um, innovative ways of reaching out to young people to going in their, in their spaces, not inviting them to ours, but going to their spaces which they feel safer. So yes, I mean it is something that uh, has a 
that we really focus quite a lot. We have some successes, but um, it's more. It's, there's still many more challenges, uh, indeed. Thank you very much, Yasna. I think you point out a very important point in the end when it comes to conclusion that we inclusion that we have to go to the places where these people already are and participate in order to make sure that we include them in the processes. Uh, now I'll pass the floor to Mihai, Elsie, Christiana. You have been involved in processes. You already presented different processes you've been, you've been involved in. So whoever you would like to take the floor and maybe share with you on how did you maybe overcome this challenge when it comes to inclusion in the in the project, for example, Christiana, that you implemented and all the work that uh, the Youth Forum is doing on mobilization um, of, of uh, diverse groups of young people? Well, um, of course, the process is constantly changing and it needs to be constantly evolving and changing. And the pandemic just highlighted us the need of using also digital tools. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, that's not um, the solution uh, to be more inclusive, uh, to be more diversity inclusive. Uh, we need, uh, we still need to take more measures and indeed we have to keep uh, the in-person trying and the in-person meetings in order to uh, reach out to those young people that they are uh, either uh, have to face um, fewer opportunities or are people with disabilities. Uh, and as a European youth firm, I think um, we did our best. It was also a challenge for us um, because as a board is as well, we started our mandate um, being in the pandemic. Uh, but when it comes to the youth dialogue, um, great work has been showed uh, from the national working groups, from all the youth organizations involved. Uh, and we need to highlight that with few resources, uh, they've managed to cope uh, and to still be active still be there for the process, still try to be inclusive. Thank you very much, Christiana. I'll go on to the next question, so we have a bit more time, and this time we'll go with the next question directly, firstly, to uh, Dragos. Um, so the next question from Jakub was very much on the pace on how youth participation happens, is that sometimes it takes uh, take us quite a lot of time to go through the process of participation uh, and then go on into the results that we have improved this, but then there is still space for in improving. And then we have COVID on the IRS time side that has developed our digital competence a bit more, so we have learned from it. So what do you think? What can we do in order to a bit speed up the pace when it comes to the mechanisms that we are using? Or maybe we actually have a good pace. What in your opinion? opinion um, is, is, uh, is, the, is the answer in this direction, because the Advisory Council Youth has a very structured approach in their work, so maybe you can share it, share it with us a bit from your perspective. Uh, yes, <clears throat> indeed we have a very structured approach, and uh, as I said, uh, we have been working and hope to adopt a recommendation, which will be an international or European standard on protecting youth civil society and youth participation in political uh, uh, processes. Uh, and uh, we do see there are many challenges to making this work. Uh, some of them, first of all, we need to make sure that participation is uh, based in human rights and that there is an understanding of human rights uh, among young people and decision makers, and also that there is an understanding on democracy, what democracy actually means. There have been a lot of debates now in the public sphere on whether certain rights can be limited uh, in order to protect uh, public health, uh, how this can be done. And even though uh, the Council of Europe does has guidelines for member states on you know, how to address COVID specific and uh, sanitary crisis specific uh, situations, some member states have uh, not respected these uh, guidelines. Uh, and uh, of course, there is a lot of misunderstanding. People think that there is, uh, some people think that uh, you can never have any restriction. Some people believe that it's very good that the government uh, restricts by its own will without, you know, the, uh, asking the parliament. Uh, so all these things need to be cleared out. We need to have context for participation. The context on the one hand can be digital, but on the other hand, 
uh, also needs to be physical. There needs to be spaces and contexts in which people can participate, and there needs to be uh, there need to be mechanisms and procedures specifically for this. For example, at the, uh, the Council of Europe level, we have a co-management system where young activists and governmental representatives meet together to decide on what they propose to the Committee of Ministers in terms of youth standards, but also priorities for the Council of Europe uh, instruments, such as the youth centers, the European Youth Foundation priorities, and so on. Uh, so we need to have these mechanisms and they need to have sufficient political weight. And I think this is a, a big issue. Uh, and also Elsie was touching upon it when she mentioned issues with the uh, um, uh, with the dialogue process, and um, it, it's quite obvious that if you participate, but this does not lead to decisions, or it is not clear to young people how this leads to decisions, then you have a huge issue with the process itself. It can be a you know perfect process theoretically, but it needs to lead to actual decisions, and young people need to know this. And the model of the Council of Europe is very relevant uh, because, of course, the decisions are proposed by a co-managed body, the Joint Council on Youth, as I said, with youth activists and uh, government representatives. Uh, so you know that uh, your uh, participation leads to an actual decision, and this is very important. And you also need to have Thanks. facilitators, which are often youth workers or youth organizations, and resources in order to ensure that this works. And in terms of resources, of course, it's great to see the Erasmus Plus uh, budget grow a lot. It's great to see uh, um, uh, the European Solidarity Corps projects. Uh, but uh, we we know that sometimes there have been issues, and this is not from a Council of Europe perspective, but rather from uh, my contact with the National Youth Council. There sometimes have been a problem with involving youth activities in national recovery and resilience plans, uh, and sometimes there are challenges Nikai, if you with can just address. Conclude, if you can yes. conclude, because in order for to have a bit more space for questions. Sorry. No, no, I'm really sorry, but this is uh, this is it, uh, and I will I will stop now. Thank you. Sorry for stopping you, but we just want to have at least one or two persons that will join us also. So just in order to hear some more questions, I know that you wanted everyone to answer all the questions, but this will make us stay here for a couple of hours in order to do so. And thanks everyone for being so active in the chat. I'm hearing from my co-facilitators that there is resource, resources shared already. It was mentioned uh, Salto Inclusion and Diversity, and they also have quite some resources. They have shared them with you in the chat, so check them out. I would like to uh, offer the sport, uh, space for Beatrice. Um, if you can join us uh, live and um, share with us a quick question and then maybe tell us directly whom do you, would you like this question to be answered by. Um, and then I'll ask Wendla to get ready afterwards again with a specific question, a person they would like to be um, uh, answered, uh, from whom would they like this question to be answered. So, Beatriz from Portugal, sorry. Beatriz Hi everyone, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. My question is more directly to Jasna. Um, I'm, I'm um, a disabled person, so I would like to refer that it is very important for me that these initiatives are carried out online because I don't think I would be able to participate the same way if it was uh, an in-person conference. However, just like Damiana said, uh, these online um, Platforms also have limitations from people uh, from different economic backgrounds. So the, the two paths we can go through is whether, uh, addressing the gap between people with access to digital tools and people without access to digital, digital tools, and also um, disabled people that are uh, that are able to attend this in-person conferences and the disabled people who are not and need more accommodation to do so. So how do you think we can address this gap and allow everyone to participate in whether online or in-person conferences? And how do you think we can improve also hybrid events so that they are more enga engaging and more interactive and therefore accessible to everyone? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Do you have an idea of who would like this question to be answered from? Because we won't have time to hear everyone. Because I think it was addressed uh, to me very quickly. Ah, okay, else? sorry. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, I will just yes. quickly, and so somebody else has also a bit of something to say. I think it's um, it's fair to say that uh, we have been now, after one year and a half and longer, uh, being online, we have a bit of practice uh, of being in online events and even hybrid events. I mean, the youth conference in, in Portugal was a hybrid event. I think it was partly also in, in, in Berlin. So um, the youth community and every organizer have done a fantastic job in it. Um, we may be tired of it sometimes, but I would like to be physically there, but you raised a very important point. Um, for some people, it's easier to be online. And I think what, one of the great things after the pandemic will be that we will be that we are more flexible. So we don't have to go everywhere physically. We can go, but we can also combine it. And uh, I must say, at the beginning, a lot of us, uh, I was amazed at all the platforms that young people use. And I said to have a very steep learning curve, how to do that. I wasn't always best in it. But youth organizations have been, young people have been. So I think one of the consequences will be that we will maybe maybe we'll never go back to only go physical in into events, but we will keep this online, hybrid, and physical. And I think we're doing quite a good job also right now. And it's a very good observation because for some people it's easier to be online, for some people it's easier to go there. So um, I think it's a good thing actually that we draw some some lessons learned from this uh, process. And I think it will be even easier to organize uh, conferences like this. This is from my side. Maybe somebody else could also answer. Thank you very much, Jasna. We will go on with the next question because we have one more ready question for the next person. And then with this, we will close the question round. Lar Larissa Lloyd from Austria would like to join us with the question live. Uh, Larissa, do you, do you hear us? What is the specific question and the person that you're addressing the question to? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Um, my question is actually very similar to the one before. Um, but it's not uh, specifically to, to disabilities, but something else that was mentioned. People from lower income back uh, households that do not have the possibility to join online events, even though they may have a device, but the device may only be an online phone and not a laptop where you really have the capability to talk to people. But the big problem I think is that we forget is that you just don't have the space at home. You don't have a quiet space where you can go back and talk to people. So do you have any solutions how we could reach those people? Thank you. And the question would go to? Or? Okay, then I'll offer it to the speaker. Okay, thank you. Um, no, yep. I think Yasna or Christiana will be the best people to answer it. Maybe Christiana, you because I said Christiana, you can Christiana can take uh, this one. Yeah, maybe if somebody can also tell me again because I've lost completely their connection. The question was very much also on the inclusion, uh, the same direction as the previous one. It comes to people with disabilities, but this one, this time with me, with people who also face some economic um, um, barriers. It's also for people that maybe do not have a quiet space home where they can join in. So it's easy to have a mobile phone, but what about maybe the infrastructure for, that allow us to actually participate fully in these meetings? Do you, have you heard yeah. of some practices? Um, Okay, I think also yes, and I can take this question as well. But I think um, it is indeed a very huge question when we say we give access to young people through digital tools, if those uh, tools are actually accessible uh, to all young people or the platforms are also accessible uh, in many ways. Uh, are those young people living in rural areas? Uh, do they have access on the Wi-Fi? So uh, in terms... so. Since we are talking about the youth dialogue process, uh, to my understanding, is like we need to empower the national working groups. We need to empower the youth organizations that they are leading the process, uh, especially the national youth councils. They need to have the resources and the, um, the toolkit, let's say, that they can actually reach out uh, to those young people with fewer opportunities, or at least to have the opportunity to run the extra mile and reach out to those young people. Thank you very much, Christiana. Thank you very much for the uh, for our participants who are already asking more questions. But I'm, because of time, we would have to stop the open questions now. Uh, I would like to thank our guests because I have one final question for each one of you as a closing statement. Because of time, we will not have more than around 30 seconds. You know, in this youth dialogue, we want to speak about actions. We want to speak about policy recommendations, but we also want to speak about actions and what can we do now. This was the implementation phase. So the question is the same for each one of you. Uh, 
Um, so if you can think of one action at the moment that has to be done in the moment, I know it's hard to choose, what would that action be in order to ensure space and participation for all? One specific action that we can take the, and do now. So uh, maybe we can start again with the same route as we did it. So Mihai, the space is your, and then we are going to go with Elsie, Christiana, Urosh, and Yasna with 30 seconds each. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Milos. I would, uh, I would say that we should build co-management mechanisms at all levels of governance from local to national to European and make sure that young people sit together with decision makers at the table and make decisions. And uh, 10 seconds, I would like to also let you know that we will take a decision on a possible future youth campaign on revitalizing democracy initiated by the Council of Europe at the October meeting. And if that happens during the next year, there will be several activities. And I would like to encourage you to uh, keep close with the Council of Europe and uh, uh, you know, find out news as they come. Thank you very much, Milos, and good luck to everybody. Thank you, Mihai. Elsie? Well, um, I'd actually say having a, a functioning EU youth dialogue, even in this discussion here, you, you clearly see how I and, and Christiana are treated dif differently um, than the other speakers. Uh, we are called by our first names while the others were introduced with their last names. Um, we um, do not get to answer substantive questions. Um, I get to talk about how to be a good delegate, but cannot answer any uh, substantive questions. This is a common theme throughout the youth dialogue. Um, this, is a com this, is, this conversation now is a, a conversation between two youth representatives and the bureaucracy, um, while the dialogue is supposed to be um, between the youth and the decision makers. Um, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm very um, adamant we need to do something about this because this is not a valid form of, of um, participation. Um, this looks nice from the outside, but we aren't actually affecting anything. We aren't getting our points across and we're not having a proper dialogue. Um, this is in participation. So um, a functioning youth dialogue, which is actually between youth and, and uh, decision makers, I think would be a good first step. Thank you very much, Elsie. Thank you for the comment uh, taken. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to space the floor to Christiana. Or mix and So um, I would say prioritize the, the investments in the youth sector uh, to ensure that uh, all youth services and youth work activities are secured during um, and, of course, after the aftermath of the pandemic. Uh, but specifically the support of the youth organizations. And when I am referring to youth organizations, apart from the National Youth Councils, I'm also referring to international youth organizations and of course to the young people as such. Um, and just one last uh, comment. Jacob previously mentioned something about change. Indeed, change comes uh, very slowly and we can all admit that. But I will say um, that by having participants and youth delegates as LC, change can come faster and can help us actually, the rest of us, to be improved also in the framework of the whole process. Thank you very much, Christiana. Urosh? I don't know exactly, if I'm honest. Uh, I think that um, we need to be loud the youth work uh, community of practice needs, needs to be loud. Young people need to be loud. They need to demand to be heard um, and be persistent in that. Um, in my heart, I'm still youth worker, uh, maybe at the moment somewhere else, but still youth worker, and I know how it was. You always need to convince that what you do is something that you do good and it is valuable for the young people, local community. That doesn't change. It's always there. Uh, what I am missing, and I can speak only for Slovenia, is that I'm missing the voice of young people and I'm missing the voice of youth work organizations. I think they, you should be louder. And then others simply will need, sooner or later, listen to. That's it. Thank you very much, Uros. Jasna? Uh, thanks uh, about youth work. I have a very concrete example. Um, we are um, in the framework of the youth work agenda. We are in the process of developing actually a 
platform for youth workers where we will listen to the advice of experts of youth workers of the youth community to prepare it in the most useful way. In a very operational sense, we, the Commission has launched an expert group and uh, it will start to work uh, at its first meeting on the 19th and 20th October. And uh, it, we expected this process to end in the second half of 2022. And we are very keen. This is an expert group. It's youth workers. And we believe that youth work empowers young people. And we're very glad that this is actually a very concrete example how we can um, how we can uh, empower young people and do this with the help of uh, experts. This is an excellent, I think, example of how we, the institutions, work with, with the experts who work then directly with young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasna. Thanks to everyone. Thank you for participating in today's debate and sharing your opinion, uh, uh, answering to the questions from our participants. Um, uh, with this, I would end uh, today's debate and I'll just uh, thank everyone who followed the stream live in, on the conference website. I'm going to inform the participants that we are starting at 2. You can stay and keep the Zoom open, uh, but you can also join us a bit later. Uh, and then for the people that are joining us live, I'll ask you to join us tomorrow tomorrow at 6 for the youth concert. You can join the link from the platform or on Thursday where we are going to present the final uh, results and we are going to be discussing them with our guests. Thanks a lot everyone and then see you in one hour. Hello, my name is Philip and I come from the Institute Today is a New Day and I'll be talking about Consul to you today. Now, blah, 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 blah. Do this again. Hello, my name is Philip. I come from the institute called Dan and Sinal Dan, or today is a new day in English, and I'm here to talk to you about Quonsor. Now, before I begin, I want to first deal with this idea that young people 